Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe. I'm your host, Mr. Mokulover. And right now, we've got quite a few events to read, and we're not looking too good down here in South Africa. We've already lost Cape Town, and things aren't looking good for us, but I've just sent them more divisions. But if you'd like to read about the fall of Cape Town, because this will happen probably a few times, please go right ahead. And yet, the war rages on. The right to boom. We can confirm that the blast at the Gaiety Theater killed at least 11 people, and dozens more were injured. Most of the dead were local elites, business owners, city councillors, at least one congressman, and so forth. Langley contacts in, in county or country have confirmed their supplies and cash helped in the operation. President Nixon takes a long breath. He's gotten used to this type of business. It helps that the victims are just strangers lying mangled thousands, countless thousands of miles away of just right in front of him. Robert McNamara pauses for just a moment, noticing the reaction, but continues. The police lockdown and bomb damage will also screw with Man Manilans for quite a while, further building resentment. Furthermore, our contacts are, nothing, are noting that local Filipino papers are talking about Japanese security aid and economic enslavement. The overall effect is furthering the sentiment that the Philippines is a damaged vessel, a vassal, and not a free nation in its own right. Good. Is Langley recommending that we continue with this program? They are indeed. I assumed as much. They have my authorization to carry on. Thank you, Mr. President. Now on to the next item. Every fiber freedom has a butcher's bill. Though the earth be moved. Suddenly, the whole harbor at Valdez begins to empty. Drains almost dry. A subterranean chasm opens directly alongside the ship. Slowly, the Chenya starts sinking down into it. Soon, only its mass can be seen from the top. The dock splinters goes down with it, while crewmen try frantically to reach the people on it. No one on the dock at Valdez will survive. The longshoremen, the kids, or the dogs. An earthquake struck south-central Alaska at 5.36 p.m. today for nearly five minutes, causing massive fissures that damaged roads and buildings across the state. Subsequent tidal waves brought further devastation to sediments along the southern coast, reporting an epicenter near Prince William Sound, only 78 miles east of Alaska's largest city. Initial analyses from the U.S. Geological Survey indicated a magnitude of 9.2, stronger than San Francisco's in 1906, which is incredibly strong. Governor William Egan has declared a state of emergency for the entirety of Alaska, mobilizing the state's National Guard to begin initial disaster relief in Anchorage and the Port of Valdez. President Nixon followed suit by directing the Navy and Coast Guard to conduct search and rescue operations along the coast. However, inclement weather conditions and damaged infrastructure may preclude more extensive release operations until Sunday the latest. Total damage and casualties from the earthquake are yet to be determined, although estimates for both are high. Alaskans are more... Uh, were reportedly caught off guard due to preparations for Good Friday, and the event's sudden occurrence had left them with no time to react to either the tremors or the tsunami. Metropolitan Ambrose of the Orthodox Church in America has called for Alaskans of every faith and creed to, take, to treat their fellow Alaskan with benefits worthy of our Lord God, as we rebuild from the tragedy that has struck this great and holy Friday. In five minutes, the devil swallowed a whole town. It's a talk's revenge. As families across Alaska were sitting down to dinner, a sudden series of tremors erupted, lasting for almost five minutes. After the dust had settled, over 100 people lay dead in what we now know as the most powerful earthquake in North American history. In addition to the tremors themselves, the city has been racked by landslides, fissures, and tsunamis, as well as widespread destruction of railway lines. The rescue effort is ongoing, with survivors and bodies being pulled from the collapsed buildings in Anchorage, but emergency services were woefully unprepared for a disaster of this magnitude and do not have the resources to adequately deal with it. If we send disaster relief immediately, we'll boost our potential capital not only in Alaska but across the nation as we prove that we are capable of protecting our citizens. Uncle Sam to the politically motivated rescue. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Hmm. Alright, so we got some fighters, we got some of these guys, and I apologize, I said this at the last video that I would do this. But I forgot about it, so I sometimes forget to do stuff like this. So uh, let's see, just scroll through all these. Let's get rid of all these planes here because I don't see the point of having them all like this. Uh, actually, not you guys. Oh, almost there. Boom, boom, boom. Good, good, good. And a lot of CVs, which is totally fine with me, even though they don't have a lot of planes on them, which kind of sucks. You can almost hardly tell. If you've selected these guys or not, it's just ever so slight, uh, slightly less highlighted. My apologies for this. Come on, almost there. And boom, boom. My gosh, America starts off with so many planes, so many fighter wings, and just wings in general. There you go. Cool. Goodbye. Sixty-seven selected. Jesus, so many. Polls updated. Oh yeah, yeah it's election season, so. Nice. New South Wales? Yes. Thank you. Because we're going to need to send you some boys. Oh, improved jet cast. We got some casts there. Even though I think we can only send 180. Wow. Alright. So be it. Are we doing some good damage? Yes, we are. We're finding enemy planes as well. 
And my goal is to make sure we don't get encircled, but make sure we uh, kill off a lot of enemy soldiers, too. Help out if you can. So, obviously, there's only one division. We can't do that much here. So, and actually, what can we do here? Operation Phycron. Pick a research. Uh, we have enough expertise. Five radios? Why not? We've got a couple goblins to go through as well. They're training more soldiers, training more people. Uh, oh, protect American businesses? Might as well. It doesn't really matter too much. Eventually, I'm going to stop doing this just because it doesn't really matter too much. Uh, working together, working together. Tricky Dick is having a good old time for now. <clears throat> and we have no political power. Go figure. I just want to help defend where they're getting attacked. Actually, are you guys doing okay up here? Yeah. Okay, Kennedy shows us true colors. Among the guiding principles of our nation is a belief that all men are created equal before the law. And there's nobody in our government, nor should there be anybody, who considers himself immune to the very laws he swore to defend and uphold. This is not a matter of partisanship. This is a matter of democracy and dictatorship of Americanism and anti-Americanism. Vice President Kennedy, are you insinuating that the investigation into the president for criminal activity is justified? I am saying that any question of alleged wrongdoing on the president's part can only be answered in the court of law. If President Nixon is impeached and removed from office, how will you react? I respect the decision of the Senate. Nixon grabbed the clicker and switched off the TV with a grunt of frustration. He thought that Kennedy could smooth things over the press uh, conference instead. He all but admitted that he was leaving his own president out to dry. Every day it feels like as if another prominent member of his administration was issuing some kind of veiled condemnation, hoping to save their own hides if he went down, just like rats on a sinking ship. And rats they most certainly are. Death of MacArthur. Oh no! What are we missing here? Anti tank transport helicopters? Hmm. No supply from... Oh, that's no supply from... Oh, that's not good. We need a port here, huh? Yeah, that's actually really, really not good. Which means we've got to break into Cape Town eventually. Today, Douglas... A uh, General Douglas MacArthur, who led the defense of the Philippines at the start of the Pacific War, has died at Walter Reed Army Medical Center of Bilary Cirrhosis at age 84. At a state funeral authorized by the President, he will be laid to rest in Norfolk, Virginia. MacArthur has a contested and complicated legacy. He had served in France in the First World War, superintendent of West Point, serving or served as part of the court-martial of... General Billy Mitchell. After his assignment to the Philippines, during which he became the youngest American Major General age of 44, and was appointed Army Chief of Staff in 1930, and after leaving that post was named the Field Marshal of the Semi-Independent Philippine Army in 1935. But his role in putting down the bonus army of World War I veterans in, his, in 1932, and his failure to prevent the Japanese from occupying the Philippines left his reputation in tatters. It was the latter that resulted in his dismissal by President Joseph Kennedy, and has since been considered either the man that lost the Pacific, or the scapegoat for the failed American war effort against Japan. He used his new civilian role to try to rally the American people to fight the <clears throat> fight the war, but his constant criticism of President Kennedy's and Harry Truman's alienated him from politicians and the general public, especially when he made comments favorably admiring Asian culture and people later in the war. The general's detractors considered him egotistical, aloof and pretentious, while others called him courageous, intelligent, and inspiring. Many National Progressive Party members and leaders have long believed that MacArthur could have won the war against Japan had he been properly supported, but that is a question that will never be answered. Old soldiers never die, they just fade away. We need a port. We really desperately need a port. <clears throat> oh boy. Yeah, I don't know what's up with the African Rex Commissariats, but they're really, really strong right now. Then again, I mean, I don't think South Africa is destined to win the war, so. Dr. Strange Glove. Mm -hmm. um, I think this happens every single time when we play as America, so if you'd like to read about Dr. Strange Love, I thought I said Dr. Strange Glove, but Dr. Strange Love, please go right ahead because I think this happens every single time in the U.S., so. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is a war room. Cool. Then I do have a cup of coffee to keep us nice and warm, warm, warm. Wow, look at all, what they want to do. They, thank goodness. Throw them in there, boys. A cafe in St. George's. On the street right below his apartment, John is waiting outside a cafe owned by his cousin. Before the war, he could go there to unwind from the working at St. George City Hall. But now he spends most of the day as a patron of it. The fall of the British government, the Americans' and Navy arrival in Bermuda made his job more than a little obsolete. As he put his empty coffee cup down, his cousin Paul came over to collect it. Everything all right, mate? As he wipes his uh, down the table. Same as every other day, I suppose, he responds. Well, there's a nice day, in it? <clears throat> yeah, I'm really enjoying the sun. We're getting singing. I want to be a drill instructor. I want to shave off all my hair. I want to wear that smoky bear. Directly adjacent to the pair, a group of U.S. Navy SEALs were undergoing one of the routine exercise drills. They counted at around 15 men, all dressed in green and blue military fatigues who were led by a drill instructor. Most of the time, the Yanks would use their outer roads for this sort of thing, but they would also sometimes come into the towns due to the low amount of traffic. After a handful of minutes, the soldier boys finished passing by. Anyway, yeah, I'm really enjoying the weather we're having. Would you like anything else? Okay, so this image. <clears throat> I was on Wikipedia, and I believe this is from the 1980s, and he's holding a Browning M60? So, I don't know. This... I, I was looking at Wikipedia about the M60 one day because my friend was asking about it, so it's very weird seeing this picture here. <laughs> It's very weird, but makes sense. 
for to be the Mustang. In New York City, Ford has standard the world with what will surely become an all-American classic. Suddenly, a gleam from its long, shiny red hood, the frame that carried it sleek and svelte like a Hollywood prima donna. The chrome bumpers, her ritzy ringlets, necklaces, and earrings. Its cabin lay bare to the elements, as if it wished to show to the world the velvet cushions that lined its seats, the silvers and ivories topping its every knob and handle. When the company salesman keyed its engine on to purr like a docile housecap, when it stepped on the pedal, it roared with pride and darted around the track as a man-made cheetah. The crowd of hundreds had become tens of thousands, then tr eyes transfixed as the engineering marvel graced the world's fair with its presence. They were greeted with numbers and features moments later. 2,000 pounds of treated steel. <clears throat> Rear wheel drive, about 15 feet from bumper to bumper. Three speed manual transmission, V8 engine rates at under 200 horsepower, an Olympian in the shape of a car, yours for the low, low price of $2,368. Needless to say, the Mustang to be with the city's worth of applause. Yeah, the actual commissary that's a really uh, beefed up, it feels like. But then again, South Africa, like I said, sucks. Strike the match. Cool. And we did all this. We did all this. The Indian subcontinent. For one, Raj's corpse sprung two governments following the British withdrawal. The Republic of India and the Azad Hind movement coalesced in Bengal. War weariness had deprived Japan of its momentum by the time they set their sights on the British Empire's crown jewel, impelling them to free most of India as a neutral power instead. Tokyo has since seemed content with letting the cats pause and Calcutta bet against their adversaries in New Delhi for the subcontinent's destiny. The U.S. can and will do its part in tilting the odds towards a fellow democracy's favor. Already, a slew of American companies have begun moving part of their assets into a glowing, growing cities, and its anticipation of a growing relationship President Nixon's in inevitable entourage will catalyze. Cool. What can we do up here? Not too much. Maybe sway some voters to a certain way, but you never know. Cool. Oh, come on, man. Uninspired campaign? Alba Speer requests weapons. Our diplomatic attache in Edinburgh has received a request coming from Helmut Schmidt on behalf of Albert Speer, one, co one of the contenders in the German Civil War. The modern diplomat, known for his pro-American stance, asked for support in the conflict, offering an exchange to grant our country a favorable position in diplomatic relations once the war is over, which isn't doing too bad so far. While we're under no obligation to help their side, several advisors to the president agree that helping Speer win against his opponents would mean having a chance of normalization. Even more, they point out that all others, especially Goring and Hadrich, would pose an immediate and dire threat to America and perhaps to the world as a whole. What should we do? Uh, yes. I don't think I've ever seen Speer win. I don't think I have. I've always seen Goring, Borman, or even ne never Hadrich win, so. Yeah, I had to send tanks because we're out of uh, helicopters, so. You guys, please stop attacking. Alright, so at this point, I'm not going to cut down this anymore, so we'll just keep spending. Oh, look, 11 billion, not bad. Entry 43, some cop thought it was a good idea to snoop behind the jalopy, so now my skull is split open like a watermelon. Well, not actually split open, but you know what I mean. Listen, I'm baked enough to shrug off the migraine a bit. Gotta ask Carlos where he gets his bud sometimes. We're buddies, so it's no big deal, right? <clears throat> It's no fun grounding yourself in your own house because of an injury. Nothing to do but toke, watch the BS the media shovels, maybe get around to finishing coursework. Just kidding. I haven't touched a textbook in months. So just, so just toke and watch BS, pretty much. Seeing your mug for a flash second before Cronkite plays a script about hooligans in the streets got old and thin pretty quickly. Harry thought I should get a hobby, so I said, why bother? All I'm good at is smoking pot and giving myself a concussion for doing the decent thing. That and the army's out to hand me my papers any day now. What do hobbies matter when a Nazi's bound to riddle my chest with lead either way? Can't understand her sometimes, honestly, but I guess that's part of her charm. Her helpfulness and sunny bright outlook, I mean. In other news, prom's coming up. I can either go stag or go someone. Kidding again, who's a poor sap who will want to partner up with old, poor old me? But the food's free and all that matters. I'll probably just loiter around and leave as soon as I get my fill buffet line. See the dancing for the phonies. Lucky enough to have a future. So I'll write some more as soon as I find something new to talk about. Tomorrow, the day after that, next acid trip, who knows? Peace out, Jules. Very nice. Actually, with all the soldiers we sent, how, how big is the airbase? 200? Not bad. And did it modify itself to go down to, like, hmm, like 180 when we had that earlier? So. Cool. Saka Republic. I don't remember which one that was, but just kind of keep hanging out. Keep holding for now. Uh, supplies are actually really, really bad around here. If anything, I might send the helicopter somewhere else. Maybe we can get... Well, the only closest port is all the way up to Quillemain or... No, Stolzhofen. So, really, we got to be continue staying here, I think. Seriously, how, how strong are these guys? Like, holy crap. They don't have that much manpower left, stockpile-wise. They've got, like, no guns. The Rex Commissariats. they got some tanks and support equipment or, you know, IVs. A few planes here and there, but other than that, not too much. Uh, 67,000. Also, Africa's got way too many just because they did 100 for one, so. Surprised these guys aren't taking any sort of attrition. Nixon staffers arrested. What do you mean arrested? What do you mean? 
I think I've said repeatedly, Nixon ain't a crook, and he keeps saying that, so we gotta believe him, right? Let's see. New England. NPP victory, tilt RD, tilt RD. Ooh, we might want to do East Coast, leaning RD, maybe toss up, toss up, nah. Safe NP in the Deep South, Upper South. Might be NP, NPP, let's see. Likely for the Southwest, Great Lakes. NPP, NPP, leaning, toss up. Mm, toss up. Mm, let's do Great Plains. Let's try Great Plains. Why not? The ball fall of Bloemfontein. Good. Nixon staff is arrested. The men were let out of the state war and navy building, handcuffed by FBI agents, trying their best to not look remorseful in front of the press as dozens of fla popping flashbulbs. The charges had yet to be announced publicly, but few had any doubts about what they were. Those who hadn't violated federal wiretapping laws were invariably involved in the cover-up that followed. The press was less interested in what the crime they committed, however, and more to who ordered them. They are all risen to answer one question, how high to up does it go? Richard Nixon watched the parade from 180. Silently, a few minutes of condemned were marched past the press into a waiting police van. He knew Hoover could have dragged his feet and delayed the warrants if he wanted to, but he clearly had no interest in sticking by as president. Should have fired that dude on day one, Nixon, Nixon, Nixon muttered to himself as the van sped off and the reporters dispersed. <clears throat> Part of any of them could have worked, but that would require them being tried and convicted first, not to mention burning away more goodwill than that than it's worth. Like all the other messes bearing down upon him, Nixon would need all the allies in time to get out of this, and both were in dangerously short supply. Oh, could you guys actually win here? I'd prefer attacking this tile, but... If you guys can actually win, and we can make a break for... Cape Town? That'd actually be really, really good. African Adventure, Pipe Radio, cool. And what can we actually do here? Oh, we can have some political power to do some stuff, huh? Junction City, Speed, Ranch Hand. Is there anything down here, too? Yes, but... Mm, discontent will rise, change service requirements. Spreader message. Nah. Hmm. Supply consumption goes down by 15%. That's not bad for three months. I like that one actually right now. Division attack would be pretty good, but I, su supply is really bad down here, so. There you go. So, when removed, we gain operation, all that stuff. Which is pretty good. Cool. And you are right there. Get down here too. Help us take out Cape Town. Come on, come on, come on. Hey, there we go. Nice. Good, we got more stuff done. I know I said we had some comments to go to, and we still have to get to some comments, but we'll get there soon. Interception. Let's grab some more anti tank, shall we? Come on, come on, come on. Oh, come on, man. Let's get in there. Yes, we got it. We got the port city back. Immediately engaging them. Engaging them. Beat them up. Ooh. <clears throat> now, the goal isn't to win. I just want to make sure that South Africa can hold on until, like, you know, things happen. We'll put it like that. Cool, there you go. Nice, 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 nice. Operational success. We love it. First comment. Someone recommends that we win in Africa and properly decolonize Africa. So we'll see. We'll definitely see. No guarantees. But looks like we're doing okay with, with taking these guys out. That actually helped us out quite a bit. So <clears throat> Indian subcontinent. I love India. Recognize the Republic of India. Whether well, they are to fear for renewing tensions with Japan or simple indifference, the U.S. government has never received nor accorded either of India's governments since 1946. In hindsight, America has acquiesced perhaps too readily to the sphere's vaporous threats when it could have earlier laid the groundwork for countering its ambitions in Asia-Pacific. The Nixon administration will reverse this trend by acknowledging opportunity out of a geopolitical hotspot. In the following weeks, the president himself shall visit New Delhi to formally recognize Mr. Nehru as president of the subcontinent's rival government. Aw, oh, yeah. Are you guys actually attacking here again? Uh, guys, you can just kind of hold. Yeah, don't, don't lose that type of stuff. Yeah, kind of, <clears throat> kind of hang out for now. Iberia offers to at least Salatama. Cool. And this is South, as the war in South Africa continues to ramp up, so does involvement in Iberian partners. The Iberians, much to our pleasure, have stood behind their commitments within the conflict and have stood to provide much coveted support for our forces as well as those of our allies. In recent communication, the Iberians have pledged a significant expansion to their existing support within the war. The communication to the D.C. outlines many intricacies and details of current Iberian intentions within the conflict, but one pledge within the document stands out from others. <clears throat> 
The Beards Island of Sao Tome, which rests just north of the equator, is not too far from the coast of Central and West Africa, carries great potential as a logistics hub for the duration of the conflict. Following the establishment of our beer and operations in South Africa, they now believe the situation to be appropriate to lease access to the island to us, creating us an invaluable logistical asset. Senior military officials believe that the port of Sao Tome may be effectively used as the logistics waypoint and furthers a possible bear air base for a bomber aircraft fleet. Whilst plans for the usage of the land remain in the preliminary stages, we gratefully accept the beer and lease proposal, and it is estimated that logistical operations of Upon the island will commence in a matter of mere months. Cool. Very cool. Mm. Cool. Alright. Understood? Stabilize our beer because they gave us some stuff. And we're just spending much more money because we can. We got a million, huh? That's a lot. Looking still pretty good. Not even going to bother with that. Alright, so we just want to kind of watch and maybe... I mean, maybe we could take out a few more divisions, I suppose. That would be okay with me. <clears throat> no, guys, don't attack when you don't have to. I still have an MPP campaign? Nice! Send over guns. Wait, which one is... Do we have... We don't have enough expertise to do that, so... Hand out loans. Oh, yeah, GDP growth. That'd be really good, actually. We need to save our political power, then. No, let's close this one, because we don't need to do that. So, oh, send over guns. <clears throat> yeah, I'm good. I'm, I'm okay. Can you guys actually win there? Oh, the heating pot. Oh, boy. No, yeah, you might be able to win. No, yes, no, yes. I don't know. As the death count steadily rises, the more and more honest Americans mourn their loved ones, and political temperatures rising up at an alarming speed after dozens of weekly reports for the FBI documenting ever larger protests breaking out all throughout the country. They're, they, now they are no longer needed to warn the government about the rising discontent, as the president himself found out today when he looked from the window of the White House. Right before the gates. To the presidential residence stood grim and silent, dozens of men and women of all ages. Some held photos of husbands, children, brothers, and whose bodies lost in the jungle were mangled beyond recognition. Couldn't even hold for a last goodbye, others posters decrying that, that use of sacrifice of human lives and accusing the bloodthirsty capitalists who feed on death to be the true force behind the government's decision to increase the draft. The guards outside were visibly, visibly in difficulty. They surrounded the small crowd, but didn't try to dislodge them as they were unarmed and quiet. They didn't scream or try to force the block. All oh, they waited there. They're just looking out at a certain window where a certain person was looking back. The prison couldn't see their eyes. They were too distant for that, but he could feel, feel it. That cold, unwavering stare full of hate and desire for revenge made chills down run his spine. We need to get a handle on this. <clears throat> we'll get a handle on it, eventually. Senators Johnson, Bennett, and Speaker of the House McCormick sat across from the President Nixon in the Oval Office. The tension between the three congressmen is so thick you can cut it with a knife. All the formalities had been dealt with, so all that remained was their assessment of how the upcoming impeachment trial would go. McCormick was first to break the ice. The situation in Capitol Hill is, to put it bluntly, sir, gloomy. Nixon's brow furrowed. Gloomy? Yes, sir, McCormick replied, not missing a beat. When the articles of impeachment are read before the House, there's no question as to which way the vote will go. As for the Senate, Johnson took over from where McCormick left off. In the Senate, you'll need, what, 34 votes to equip? You'll probably get 12, maybe 15 if you're lucky. Even if I put my fear of God into every senator on the floor, you'll never hit 34. In which way would you gentlemen vote? Nixon asked the senators. They stared down at the floor, their silence betraying their intentions. For a brief moment, a maelstrom of rage seemed to brew behind Nixon's eyes, but it vanished as quickly as it appeared. The rest of the meeting was rather unremarkable, as the senators departed the White House into a swarm of journalists, trying to glean a hint of what went on in there. Nixon, however, would not reveal his thoughts on the meeting until he sat down for dinner with his wife and daughters that night. The girls were moving back to California. End of the line. <clears throat> Richard Nixon stared at the faces surrounding him in the East Room staffers. Uh, oh, staffers, Secret Service, cooks, custodians. All of them having served his administration as loyal as they could for the past four years, he decided to pontificate to them for a few minutes. At the very least, he could learn not what to do what he said, what he did. <clears throat> And remember, he concluded, though your enemies may try to drag you down, never stop down, uh, stoop down to the level. Never sink into their pettiness and spite. Never submerge yourself in hate, because once you do, they'll triumph and you will destroy yourself. It's been an honor. Thank you. He stepped out of the East Room to muted applause. With all the paperwork signed at noon, just seconds away, Nixon opened the doors to the South Lawn of the White House, holding it for Pat, Patricia, and Julie, followed by John and Jackie Kennedy. The press, of course, turned out to revel in his dethronement, the final twist of the knife, but Nixon took it in stride. He wouldn't be there for them to kick around much longer. And the stairway to Marine One. Nixon shook Kennedy's hand, simply stating, Keep her steady, Jack. He climbed the stairway and turned around for one last look at the White House, the staff, the guards, the reporters, cameras, and he couldn't stop himself from smiling. He gave a wave and threw up two Bs for victory signs, chuckling at the fervent applause he got from the crowd. He then turned around and stepped onto Marine One in into history. He was soon borne away by the waves, lost in darkness and distance. And the focus here would change. No! I want to recognize India, though, but that's okay. Let's get out of that political power. Tricky dick. He's still not a crook. He never committed any any wrong actions. What? No impeachment trial. What? What do you mean? 
Oh, Mr. Handsome here. Hey, Mr. Handsome's here. Now we're feeling good. Ah, I love JFK. The pre Kennedy presidency. After the resignation of the Richard Milhouse Nixon, it appears Americans once again are able to look to a leader who inspires trust, hope, and confidence in the in JFK. Having desired the presidency for many years, it appears Providence has done what JFK himself could not. Clear of wrongdoing in Nixon scandals, Kennedy stands ready with the support of the nation to shape the U.S. into a tr tr truly greater and freer country. From civil rights to social programs, the Kennedy presidency is shaping up to be a prosperous one. Should he succeed in the upcoming presidential elections? Oh, I hope he does. I really hope he does well. It'd be a shame if he didn't. It'd be a real shame. I hope nothing bad happens. I hope he's here for the next several years. I really do. A hard hat riot breaks out in New York. The whole debacle began when a group of college students decided to hold a demonstration in New York. Enough was enough, they said. America must leave South Africa immediately. War was good for absolutely nothing but the pockets of death's business suited merchants, and neither rhetoric nor propaganda can sway the commitment to peace and love for all men. So with the long flowing hair and picket signs and slogans, they packed wall and broad streets by the thousands to profess their unconditional demands. The city's working men disagreed. Among the most vocal is Peter J. Brennan, president of Alliance of New York's largest construction and engineering unions. To a man he and his fellow union men agreed, America had a moral obligation to protect democracy from fascism's encroachments not just at home but also abroad. <clears throat> Dissent from the war effort was tantamount to treason, so with their hard hats, old glories, and steel toe boots, 200 construction workers coalesced into a counter-protest and federal hall to profess their unconditional patriotism. All that kept a semblance of order was a thin and shaky border of policemen and sandwiched between two raucous mobs. And when it broke or opened wide as, it, as does a gatekeeper does when bribed, order had collapsed into a bout of naked assault. Hippies and hard hats brawled each other out until they couldn't, and couldn't couldn't anymore. While a broad swath of New York lay sacrificed as collateral damage, it took the city two hours to rain in both, but by more, by then, more than 70 people and untold millions of property damage had fallen victim to one of the worst riots since the Civil War. President JFK is expected to make an announcement to ameliorate tensions lingering from the hard hat riot, though whether or not it can succeed in doing so remains to be seen. How can one so temper the spirit of millions? Well, somewhat carefully, maybe. <coughs> A cause for celebration, the Dirksen building had been quieter since Nixon's uh, resignation, which uh, which was all the better for the brothers who now found themselves enjoying dinner once again. Now, President Kennedy sat together with his brother Robert, who served faithfully as the chief of staff. I'm proud of you, you know. The circumstances aren't ideal, but I can think of no better man to be the president right now. Robert could barely contain his adoring smile. Think of all the things we can finally accomplish. Come on, Bobby, you're embarrassing me, chuckled John, who beamed nonetheless, but thank you. I know I can count on you. Always. I'll, uh, I'd leave you for the MPP or anyone else, especially when you're about to give this country the change it so desperately deserves. Robert's enthusiasm seemingly infectious prompts more laughter from his brother. Now, now, we have a lot of work to get on through before we can set things in motion. His look became more serious, more determined. The party's image is somewhat tarnished at the moment with the Nixon fiasco, so I've arranged some trips across the country to shorten support. At this, he reaches into his pocket and pulled out a long itinerary of events and dates in various states and cities and handed, handed it to Robert. Of course, we do have the election to worry about, Robert Brown, before reverting to a smile. Come on, Jack, I suppose we can just enjoy this meal before your big tour. You've earned it. And so the brothers sat there for a while, enjoying their food in peace. And as the time finally came for them to leave, Robert quickly glanced at the list and noted his brother's first destination. He smiled at his brother one last time before they departed. You know, you'll do great, Jack. I'll see you when you get back from Dallas. A fawn for world. Man, every time I read that, I just get... It just it doesn't feel good, man. It doesn't feel good. A beer provides maps for war efforts. While Portuguese colonial administration over Mozambique and Angola is a thing of the past, not more than a mention within the history books, the recent the recency of the history has now the potential to pay dividends within the war effort. In a recent coordination event or effort hosted in Washington, senior members of the Iberian military provided to us a plethora of dated maps and documentation hailing from the late era of Portuguese colonial control in Mozambique and Angola. The content of the documents provided details at great length upon the industrial and infrastructural specifications in various vital regions within Mozambique and Angola, now controlled by the Rax Commissariats of the Africa Shield. We estimate that the maps, while all dated, are likely to this day to be accurate to a high degree. This information provided by the Iberians could provide invaluable, inv invaluable information for the continued effectiveness of the American bombing campaign against our enemies as we begin to actively strike at the vital enemy logistical and industrial centers. May the bombs rain down even more accurately than before. Oh, yes, please. Can we still... Oh, we can still vote here. Uh, Rockies for the house are toss-up. Uh, no one cares about the house, apparently, though. Do they? It's election season. Yeah, this is the house stuff, so... Uh, the West Coast... Washington and California. I guess no Oregon. I guess I don't believe in Oregon in the West Coast, huh? Leading NPP, NPP, not bad. The Great Plains is a toss-up, toss-up, toss-up. I mean, that's not bad. Uh, Minnesota, Missouri, Nebraska, Dakota. 
or of the, of the northern variety. I'm going to do the Great Plains again. Let's see what we can do. Can we? Oh, we can't do it again. God dang it. Well, mm, East Coast. Well, maybe not East Coast. Safe NPP, MVP, uh, Upper South, Virginia, and Tennessee. Well, we want to hit as many states as possible. I would like maybe do the Great Lakes. We'll try the Great Lakes. Why not? The Great Plains, the Great Lakes. We'll see what happens. The Black, so Black Psyops in South Africa. In war, psychological operations are a given. What is widely known as white psyops is seen as virtually every theater of war with the distribution of state-approved propaganda such as newspapers, posters, and leaflets among foreign populations and military ranks. What is lesser known, however, is what is known as black psyops. Throughout the South African War, Iberian psychological warfare units have conducted black psychological operations in an attempt to dissuade, demoralize, and convince enemy forces and populations. These initial operations have seen some limited success, however, in conjunction with the CIA of the U.S., hoping to expand their scope of the black psyops. The Americans have proven to be rather brutal yet effective in securing a stronger hold over South African territory in conjunction with the South African government and Iberian Psychological Operation Units. An operation has been undertaken known as Phoenix Program. This operation aims to conduct a covertly psychological operation upon these upon those in South Africa who may possibly lean to support the shield of the Boers. Through exposure, public humiliation, arrest, or even torture, the CIA and Siberian, Iberians conduct a campaign of terror among the civilian population who lean in support of the enemy, aiming to neutralize the membership of the hostile organizations. This is just one of many of the black psyops concocted by the CIA, from whom the Iberians have been taking ample notes. The agency is making headway, as they should. Research? Well, we can't do that yet. That's fine. And, uh, sure, stabilize them again. A very stable Iberia. Now, we could kill these guys off here, but let's go and do that. There you go. Oh. All right. Very nice. Very cool. Let the helicopter do it. I love the president, pres presidency of the Kennedy style. Uh, let's see. Grizzle more, more unified. I you almost always choose this path, but because we're going to go a certain way, save the country, heal the people, conservative democracy, uh, other democracy, a fair deal, a square deal. Mm, ooh. Grizzle more unified. Meet with the politicians. Meet with the people. Extinguish the flames. One nation, indivisible. Bring back the NPP. One last chance. I like this one. I sure progressive seems pretty good. Let's go to heal the people because I think we get pensions. I don't like the cost, but I'll oh, try this one. While the public anger over Nixon's peculiarities have mostly come to an end, its effects have not. The American people are still suffering from deep social issues and an unemployment rate not seen since the Great Depression. This is one of the main issues that the president has been working towards fixing. With the majority of Congress standing behind him, the candidate can finally begin enacting legislation to heal the American people. And I do have coffee, uh, if, I, if I haven't said that yet. To keep us nice and warm. Growth? Absolutely. Who cares about South Africa when we can have more growth? Very, very nice. Spreader message. Discontent. Uh, it's currently middling. Not bad. Not good enough, but not bad. Ah, oh, good. Kill them faster and better. Harder. Happy 1964, everyone. Let's see. That's two ahead of time. Let's grab some more special operations. Uh, Deuterinos. How are we currently looking here? 10.4. 10.14, I should say. Spreader message. We currently get 0.62 every day. Ah, oh, I hope Kennedy lasts forever. Everyone loves a good Kennedy, right? U.S. Air Force hits low in the arms factories. Following an exchange of information between the Iberian American militaries, the USAF has been in possession of detailed information upon the logistical and industrial layout of the Africa Shield and control regions of Mozambique and Angola. The intelligence has not been left to waste. Yesterday afternoon, the U.S. Air Force bombers struck at industrial centers within Luanda, where significant arms production has been undertaken for the duration of the conflict in South Africa. Due to information provided by Iberian intelligence, American bombs were able to fall with deadly accuracy upon essential edifices within the local industry, causing irreparable or replaceable, irreparable damages and bringing a significant share of arms production in the region to a complete halt. Due to the quick and devastating nature of the new American bombing campaign, it is hoped that by many senior officials that productive capabilities of the Reichs Commissariats will be significantly hindered for the duration of the conflict. Despite this, the overall effect of the reinvigorated American bombing campaign upon the overall effectiveness of the Africa Shield is yet to be determined. A significant blow to the enemy wall machine yes please oh, let's see can we get more involved in south africa the tears of the continent the man from angola climbed the staircase two steps at a time surprised he hadn't been stopped yet at the top you would find the office of the man they call mr Zhao kennedy the american king or a prime minister or whatever they, whatever they had the big boss oh yes anyway there it was he was able to plead his cause and his case and perhaps it could help a young man stepped out of the office and looked at the angolan with surprise sorry he said but you can't just walk in here was this John Kennedy? He tried to remember the lines he'd practiced in the mirror. Excuse me, are you Zhao Kennedy? The white man looked at him with a furrow brow. I'm his chief of staff, Robert. What's this about? Who are you? The Angolan tried to remember the right words in English. I, I, <clears throat> Angolan. I come here to America because of Germans. They cause all much suffering. Since I come here, I ask for help for Angola 
as all say America is for freedom, but nobody lets me speak. I want to speak to Jacques Kennedy for my people. Robert Kennedy had heard about the killings in Angola. The Germans have been slaughtering people all over the world for 20 years, and people have been desensitized to it. But he thought maybe it was just worth trying. Maybe if they only saved a few people, surely it was worthwhile. Surely they had a duty to convince his brother. Kennedy smiled at the Angolan. Well, you sure don't have an appointment, but why don't you come in? I'm sure we can spare a few minutes for your concerns. Uh, yeah, why not? Let's see, we can do some of this stuff. War discontent. If it's, it says discontent for the war will rise. If it's red, that means really good, right? Red means good. Just like in Victoria 2, when your no red number goes bigger and bigger, that means good. I might do this one just to help them out more. Uh, anything else here? Nope. So, I, oh, democracy in Washington, D.C. D.C. has always had a rather interesting relationship inside the U.S. As a capital of the U nation, it isn't officially part of any state. Instead, a direct district governed by the U.S. Congress as a whole to ensure that any local government couldn't overpower the federal seat. When it was half-built, a swampy square of land where few lived if they could help it. This presented a few problems, but as the nation grew, so did Washington, D.C., and with over three-quarters of a million people living within its borders, more than 11 states in the Union from the 1960 census, it seemed hypocritical that the population of the capital, the world's most important democracy, shouldn't be able to vote for their leaders. Well, it's not a state. The recently passed 23rd Amendment has changed that. The citizens of Washington, D.C. have now the, have the right to vote in presidential elections, gaining them no more electoral votes than the smallest state in the Union, just so that three electoral votes for the 1963 election, 64 election, I mean. The city is a buzz of activity, as voter registration drives are taking place and polling stations in the school gymnasiums. Fire stations and community centers are taking place, as a high turnout is expected among the residents and citizens of the city. For many, this is a long time coming. A historical injustice finally righted. For others, this is only the first step. For a while, they can now vote for the residents of the White House or other, other avenues of political representation are missing. D.C. gets no member of the House of Representatives, nor the two senators that other 50 states have, and no ability to help change the Constitution that has had so long denied them their rights. Washington doesn't even have its own mayor. Instead, the city is overseen by a disinterested committee of Congress. So there's still work to be done. No taxation without representation? Well, to, so... They don't have any Senate seats, which is good, just because that would really throw this off just a little bit more. But that would be kind of cool if actually the D.C. got its own, uh, you know, senates, Senate seats. That would be kind of difficult to do, though. But, hey, whatever. I'm not here to talk about politics or anything like that. I'm just here to have a good time and lead Kennedy uh, to, have, to a good time. Dixie sleeps again. After the recent discord that has plagued the region, tensions appear to be cooling in the recently, increasingly fractious South. Over the recent weeks, there seem to have been significantly fewer instances of politically or racially motivated violence, and rallies in, south in major southern cities, both pro and anti segregation, have remarkably fewer, had remarkably fewer marchers. Time will tell whether or not this recent claim will hold, or this calm will hold, or if racial tensions will soon be inflamed by yet another tragedy. At least for now, we have some time to catch our breath. It can't get any worse if we ignore it, right? Oh, cool. Things go more popular, huh? Alright, how do we make things explode? Expound ground operations. That'll make things cool off, right? We have enough... Yep, we have enough transport helicopters. Nice. I'm glad we got that port. Heal the people. Ah, JFK is doing the right thing. A square deal, fair deal. Though many people see him today as an incompetent monster who led the president U.S. or U.S. into a disaster during World War II, Joseph P. Kennedy is rarely given credit for his domestic ideas. The first Catholic president, C Kennedy Sr., made ambitious plans for sweeping social programs, including one so-called the New Deal to the Americans. Out to get out of the Great Depression. With a country in a similar state to how it was during those dark times, Joseph's sons, JFK, stands in, up in a position to finally pass what his father could not, a social security net. Oh boy. Oh boy. I'd love to attack, but I don't think we will. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Okay, President Mexico, good job, President Mexico, good job. Hey, you guys, breast calling. I love breast. For the general chaos of the former pact, a message from Brussels reached us. The Breton Repu Republic informed us they have broken free of German rule, and among the first tasks of the free nation, they have chosen to c contact a number of leading world powers. The broadcast are considered as a mere declarations of independence for the international community, not as demands for the recognition of independence for Brittany. Despite the chaotic situation in Germany, it remains to be seen that the Bretons can hold on to the little newfound freedom. Pr congratulations, I suppose. Speer, don't give it up, please. Speer, Speer, Speer. <clears throat> Come on, Speer, you gotta hold, man. You gotta hold the line. Just tell the kids, the students, to, you know, shoot a little faster. Shoot a little better. Polls are updated. No one cares about the polls. Um, I want to beat people up. All right, can we do that? Just get a little bit more action. Oh, no, no, no. Mm. JFK, the newly inaugurated president of the U.S., smiled and waved to the crowd as the motorcade driving him through the downtown Dallas, accompanied by Governor John Connolly of Texas and their wives. Kennedy was enjoying the cool breeze through his hair and the adoration of the onlookers. 
He was already more popular than Nixon and had achieved significant success at calming the nation after Nixon's ignominious fall from grace. Connolly turned to the president, commenting that nobody could say all of Dallas didn't love him. No, replied the president, flashing the governor his whining smile. You certainly can't. As he turned back to the crowd, he heard a sudden blast, and his head blew apart, showering his wife with blood. As the dust settled, two bodies were brought into the city morgue, the president's and that of a young black man shot dead by Officer J.D. Tippett while attempting to seal a car at gunpoint. It was later identified as Martin Joseph Henry, a Guyanese immigrant who worked as a custodian in the Dallas country Dallas County Courthouse. Police investigating the house courthouse found Carcano rifle stash in a fourth floor maintenance closet, and several shell casings were found by a window overlooking the stretch of the road where the president was shot. A search of the department also revealed a motive. Henry was a fervent Guyanese nationalist, and he felt he had to stop American hegemony over his home at nation at any cost. A speaker of the House and acting vice president, John McCormick, prepared to take the oath of office. America slowly coming to grips with his tragedy just after wrapping their heads around the reality of Nixon's resignation. People are nervous for the future, both their own and that of the nation. But no matter how bleak it may seem, there is a sense that American people have to pick up the pieces and soldier on as they always have. If not us, then who? Okay, so, let's see. We have 13 days. Can we still get Social Security or uh, pensions? Can we still get pensions uh, with in here? Can we get this done? If I don't click on this, we have 12 days left, and we need 11 days to do this, so... You know... We might just get some garbage pensions for the people. It might just work. It might just work. Come on. Come on. Operational success. Good job, guys. Actually, do we have enough yet? Yes, we do. Research. Shall we? Oh. Yes, there we go. The okay, mirror's nice. And... A square deal, a fair deal. And we still have this focus. Shake on it. Swear on it. Who is that guy? Looks familiar. I don't remember who that is. Um, intelligence analysis and... Yeah, I'll see this one too. Nice. Cool. And let's take a look. Pensions, pensions, pensions. How are we already 40 minutes into this video? I feel like I just started like 5 minutes ago. Hey, we have no trinket pensions and no pensions. Oh god, that costs us more. No, JFK, no, no. No. Oh, John McCormick, come on, man. The McCormick presidency. A president in disgrace, another president shot dead, a country in chaos, and an election barely a year away. To say that the situation of the RDs is in dire straits would be the understatement of the century. Enter former Speaker of the House John McCormick, a man who's never expected to hold the reins of power, who has regardless found them thrust into his hands. At such a dark moment in America's history, McCormick will certainly have his work cut out for him. With the election approaching, within a few short months, McCormick's tenure as president will be short. He has no intentions of running as an election, simply hold, resolving to hold the Oval Office for the coming months until a new commander-in-chief can be nominated. However, with his party in shambles and the National Progressive Party making unprecedented gains, he intends to use his brief tenure to try and right the ship and save the Republican Democrats from ruin. The tarnished legacy of Nixon will need to be addressed, as a matter uh, President Kennedy was unable to attend to in his tragically brief rule. Huh, bless his heart. The fallout of the a South African war that Nixon thrust the country into will need to be carefully managed as well. And McCormick can successfully pull out the flames that his party is currently engulfed in and restore some semblance of dignity to the government. The RD party may just manage to pull through or at the very least survive absolute actoral decimation. That's okay, though. Let's let the war go on further. More people will die here, but hey, you know what? It's just South Africans, right? Let's see. RDs, toss up, RD. Oh, leaning NPP, safe NPP, not bad. Toss up, uh, leaning NP, NPP, Great Lakes, Great Plains. I want to go, oh, leaning towards an NPP. You can't trust the polls, so maybe we'll do Great Plains just to secure our votes. If we do well here, if we campaign well, so. Alright, so with all those events out of the way, usually with the Nixon in charge, things can get bogged down a little bit to the point where it's like, okay, come on, let's. There's a lot of reading, and there's a lot of events, and there's still going to be a lot of events, which is totally fine and all, and I, that's why I actually love, you know, TNO, because all the story, the events, the decisions, just a, just a story time that happens of TNO. So, we should have maybe a few, a few fewer events. But I'm probably completely wrong about that, but the burden of power. McCormick never wanted this. His career has been mostly successful, for sure. He'd always wanted to serve his country in the party, and in his tenure as Speaker of the House, had performed admirably if he did so. So, if he did say so himself, then Nixon lied, and Kennedy died, and suddenly this Boston-born son of a hod carrier found himself thrust into the highest office in the land. 
It is... <clears throat> Excuse me. I apologize for my mispronunciations in this episode. The days seemed to blur together as he struggled to gather himself. The Oval Office was a whirlwind of activity. Endless lines of politicians and secretaries rushing to give him the lay of the land. More riding in the South, one cried. Ca latest casualty reports from South Africa, Mr. President, uh, said another. The podium at the press conference was another beast. He had lost count of the amount of times he had ushered, uttered the phrases national tragedy and difficult times for us all and flashed in front of flashing cameras over the last few days. Finally, whenever he found himself a brief moment to relax, he would pick up the newspaper and read about all the grim poll forecasts and the endless rumor mail and the countless reports of anti-war protests and ensuing civil rights clashes and the lines of coffins returning from overseas. One night, sleep truly eluded him, and he found himself in the Oval Office, sitting in darkness, save only for the lights flooding in from the White House lawn. His presidency would not only be would not be a successful one. He accepted that. He made no plans to run an election to try and legitimize or extend his rule, but perhaps he could try to steady the nation well enough that who came after him could be within a shot of triumph. Stealing himself, the caretaker president and prepared for the ordeal ahead. All we can do is try, try, try and remain calm. The shock and uncertainty sparked by the wave of scandals and tragedies the party's experience has not only shattered the public's confidence in us, it's frayed the tenuous bonds that hold the various factions of the party together. With many of the R's and D's senators openly wondering if the continued existence of the United Party is beneficial to anyone, drastic action must be taken to pull the party together if we are ever to manage or to hope of salvaging the election. President McCormick will need to wrangle the squabbling factions into presenting a united front against the chaos America finds itself in. Restoring party unity will be critical to allay the nation's panic and prevent a mass defection of voters from the R.D.'s. Oh, we can do some more stuff up here, can't we? Very nice. Um, uh, diminish the center. Uh, let's not diminish them. Cool. Recruiting. Nice. No! Every time I support Shpia, he dies. Surf mania sweeps the nation, though. A tide away from the Pacific is sweeping over the nation. A musical one. A California mythos seems to have gripped the heart of every boy and girl in the country and simply can't get enough of everything West Coast. Hollywood's cranking out films like Elvis Presley's Viva Las Vegas and Blue Malibu. It feels like every new sitcom on TV set in LA and any record with the word surf in the title selling like, like hotcakes. It's even had an interesting rebound effect where some of the rock and roll and folk bands that these surf rockers admire are achieving a boost in popularity by association. While musicians like Jan and Dean, Dick Dale, and the Ripcords, and Johnny or Ronnie, and the Daytonas are enjoying various levels of success across the nation, it's clear that the true winners of the surf mania are the Beach Boys. A celebrity has reached a fevered pitch, and with legions of devoted fans following their surf rock bands every move, all the concerts have been playing or played to a sold-out stadiums packed with screaming fans that consistently perform on a variety show like the Ed Sullivan Show. And any public appearance is followed by a swarm of paparazzi, paparazzi, and their every action is chronicled by dozens of fan fanzines. Fans in Iowa strap surfboards to the cars. The shouting at the band's concert is so loud that it's almost impossible to hear them sing. And tens of thousands of teenage girls were rendered inconsolable when Brian Wilson proposed to his girlfriend, Marilyn Rovell, because it meant he was going out of the dating game. Some say that this was a collective hysteria sweeping our nation's youth. Others say that that's society's way of processing, processing the recent political upheaval by immersing itself in an idealized form of Americana. Others just think that it's got a real catchy beat. But whatever the reason is, it's clear that the surf rock is here to stay. As a genuine fact that surfers rule. The work goes on. Red, white, and blue balloons have colonized the roof of the RD Convention Hall, where the booming commotion indicates the party has come to decide who will be the RD's next presidential candidate. Ignoring the no-hopers, the two frontrunners are a Republican, LBJ, and Democrat, Wallace Bennett. Oh, first name was Wallace. The young men wearing all the way with LBJ and Bennett for America badges glare at each other through the wafing cigarette smoke. Mmm, puff, puff. Of course, it's always... As it always has since the state of Rome, the real decision-making takes place behind the closed doors in a meeting room far removed from the hurla burla of the convention hall, where a handful of craggy, white-haired men smoke cigars and ponder which man would be more likely to pay, play ball the big dogs. If they were going to get past Nixon's disgrace in the year of three presidents, they needed a candidate who would be able to galvanize the public and counter the suddenly powerful MPP. Puffing away, puff puff. They made the decision who might govern the U.S. for the next four years, like they were deciding what to have for dinner. Mmm, eat up. Bennis can provide stability all the way with LBJ. There was a comment saying that we should go with LBJ sometime. Um, I, I, I do. I, I want to play like all the presidencies. Like, don't get me wrong. I want to play all presidents. So I'm gonna go with Bennett for now, just because he seemed like the more lukewarm candidate. And because he's so lukewarm, people are like, "Oh, who? Harry's good for the economy, but who?" So it is what it is. Healing a broken nation. With the party restored to some semblance of cohesion, we must now work to win back the American people. With confidence the party is still gravely damaged, President McCormick must move quickly to prove that we are still the best choice for a better American future. 
Through dedicated and clear-headed leadership, he will show the people that the RDs are capable of guiding the nation through the crises we find ourselves in. McCormick will also need to deal with the ascendant NPP, who have taken full advantage of the crises facing us to rocket up the opinion polls. If the rise is to be halted, we need to outmaneuver them in both wards and policy, proving that we are truly the only real option to carry America forwards. The NPP election primaries and NPP... A convention concluded today with a rather surprising outcome. After most, multiple ballots, with candidates representing each of the many factions of the party over the whole spectrum of politics, including Michael Harrington and Scoop Jackson, a clear winner emerged. Daddy George Wallace, the controversial Alabama governor with his well-known and outspoken views on segregation and support for the Jimmy Crow laws on the southern states, focused most of his primary campaign not only on debates about civil rights, but on the corruption of the current R.D. administration and the increasing power of the federal government. <clears throat> He successfully torpedoed the CNPP's leadership due to the division, thus handed the nod to Wallace. In his victorious speech, the governor spoke not only about running as president for the South, but for all of America. I intend to give the American people a clear choice. I welcome a fight between our philosophy and the corruption and the heavy-handedness of Washington, telling us what to do, what to think, which now threatens to engulf every man, woman, and child in the U.S. I am in this race because I believe the American people have been pushed around long enough and that they, like you and I, are fed up with a continuing trend towards a corrupt banana republic, which now subjects an individual to the dictates <clears throat> or dictates of an all-powerful central government. Wallace has great support in the southern states and pockets of support in conserv of conservative enclaves who despise the increasing power of the government in their lives and millions more than just want to banish the corrupt and dirty politics of Nixon to the history book as fast as possible. It just remains to be seen if this can translate into victory in November. Well, Wallace finally get the NPP into the White House? Oh boy, you and me, we're voting for NPP. Oh, hello. Did you just lose there? Son. Wow, that really sucks for them. An uninsp oh come on. An uninspired campaign. Really, son. We can still an extended olive branch, but now we okay. Polls are updated. No one cares about the polls. It is, of course, almost September, and hopefully we do a good idea, good time. Civil Rights Pass Acts passes. As a commitment to providing balanced coverage of the upcoming election, KT. Uh, KTMV here in Medford and a satellite station in K Klamath Falls KOTI. Ooh, Klamath has been interviewing different candidates for the local state and federal races and to help the people of Southern Oregon determine who should be the best candidate for office. We would like to remind everyone now that the KVTM and the K KOTI are nonpartisan, and we, and we are airing both candidates from the RDs and the National PP to hear what they have to say. Today, Wayne Morris, the one candidate for the MPP, has gone on into the studio to answer a few questions regarding his party's platform. Can you hear me, Mr. Morris? Yes, I can. Go ahead. Mr. Moss, I'd like to begin asking you about one of the greatest issues facing the U.S. today, civil rights. With the President having signed the Civil Rights Act into law, and with and working towards desegregation of the American society, can you say that if you and the National Progressive Party are in favor or oppose this act? I oppose Nixon on a lot of things, but his support for African Americans is not one of them. It's not the government's place to tell the states what to do, and, it's just, and this is just overreach. It's just a little bit of overreach. Now, how can we make this explode a little bit more? Uh, I mean, South Africa is definitely trying to get back on its feet, but... Man, that looks... Oh, there goes Borman. Oh, that sucks. Healing Broken Nation. This is such a slim tile that you can barely tell that it's there. Alright. We're going to have to campaign some more. Election year. What's going on? East Coast. I wonder how many people we can get in here. Uh, toss up. Tilt. Great Lakes. Minnesota. One, two, three, four. Montana. Utah, let's see, one, two, leaning NPP, NPP is likely, <clears throat> East Coast, tilt, safe, huh, well, I don't know, New England, RDs, NPP is likely, toss up, well, you know what, let's try to do New England next, alright, let's r jack up this war discontentment, <clears throat> the right hand, uh, I kind of just want to help them out, like, send over guns, nothing, talk down involvement, no, 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 it's middling, we want to r jack this up as high as we can, bomber agility, we, we are using bombers, so, hmm, I do want to send them some guns and stuff as well, but, now we'll keep that up for ourselves, let's go with that one, cool, I think, to save the, I don't remember which way to do it, Nixon, 
Moving past Nixon, sure, why not? The past is regrettable, but we must not waste time lingering on our mistakes. The key to redeeming oneself from scandals is not to wring your hands and agonize over it, but to move forwards and prove that you're better. McCormick will embody this idea by focusing instead on the future, by working to salvage the party's image and prove that the unfortunate occurrence of his past year are not but a hiccup compared to the historical, uh, uh, historied political pedigree of the RDs. We will abandon the legacy of Nixon and cut a new path through the future. Tackling the current issues head-on would demonstrate to the American people that we are still capable of ruling as effectively as we always have. We must do as much to earn back our people's trust, but should we succeed, our tarnished reputation will be restored to greatness. Oh, look a little better. Oh, maybe not. Hmm. He was a crook, a soul in torment. Uh, I don't remember what we needed to do. So, I guess we'll move past Nixon for now. Like, other than this, like, I just wanted Wallace in. People want me to go with, like, Gamer Wallace. Or, uh, no, people want me to go with Integrity Integrity not segregationist Wallace. That's what pe some people want me to do. I I'm feeling a little bit uh, conflicted though, because I'm feeling maybe we should get the gamer Wallace. A new genre rises, cool. For American observers, the Adriatic Basin, with half abandoned villages, mottling dry plains, and brush that roll for miles without end, uh, strike similar to the long gone days of their own Wild West. Much like the frontier Adriatica, a drive without laws and constabularies. Saloons of sin and banks of marble, and poor settlers caught in the middle as they toil, a miserable living out of sand, streaked with blood and oil. Never in the present has there been a depiction of this mythical age truer than Italy's youngest province. Italian filmmaker Sergio Leone has demonstrated his awareness of such when he realized, or released, for a few dollars more late this evening, or late this year. Featuring up-and-coming Hollywood actor Clint Eastwood as a rough, tough, speaking mercenary, the movie brought new life to an old genre while introducing its own refreshing themes. Standoffs between lawmen and bandits in desolate mining towns were joined with ambitions of iconic bounty hunters, and long-held grudges tied together in a captivating plot centered around a heist. Though the film depicted America's Old West, the conflict had a show and resonated with the Italian pioneers, seeking their fortunes in the country's new frontier. Despite less than stellar reception from film critics for its over-the-top violence and campy tone, the film nevertheless broke records by reaching 14 million to the new film's gross revenue, proving that there's still a place for the new term spaghetti western and the free world's uh, silver screens. Already, rumors abound of a sequel, and directors and film studios end of us filming their own reimaginations of a bygone age or era in the very same ass savannas that evince its stories from the hearts and minds of millions. Long shall be shall the world remember Manco's name. Very nice. Yeah, South Africa seems to be doing well now, so we're not going to really help them out. After this, a soul in torment, especially among northern progressives, uh, he was a crook. Did not go over well with Southern Democrats, huh? I think I did this one, uh, a soul in torment. I think I did a soul in torment. So I want to do he was a crook, maybe. Richard Nixon was not just a crook, he was a crook in denial. All lies. Not only did he commit acts of unacceptable corruption, he refused to accept responsibility and denied any involvement until the truth was practically forced out of him by the courts. This is not a man the R.D. should ever associate with their image with, and in the interest of showing that justice still reigns in the land, he must face the consequences. Nixon will be given no pardon, condemning him to a face indictment and punishment. He will be treated as any other corrupt official would be treated, and made an example of to America at large. His more diehard supporters may not appreciate this, but unlike Nixon, President McCormick is not afraid to speak the truth. He is a crook, and... McCormick is, will be out of the gates and out of the house or the presidency soon enough. The Cape Town Sea Lift. The South Africans need those guns. The Cape Town yesterday. Don't get me keep me waiting like this again. General Major B Bigelow snapped before slamming his phone receiver down on the representative from Norfolk and Western Railway. After sparring a second for a quiet sigh, he picked up the receiver again and poured over the rail timetables provided by the Ordnance Corps. Outside Bigelow's office, the young Major winced and turned to his colonel as the phone receiver crashed down again. I know we're all up to our eyeballs organizing the CF to South Africa, but what's got General Bigelow so worked up? Whatever supplies the South Africans didn't abandon, they're all burning through in days. The colonel replied testily. They're throwing out all munitions of men they have at the Nazis, and soon they'll be out of both. And besides, the colonel pointed at a campaign medal on the general's desk. Twenty years ago, Major Bigelow was a logistics officer during the defense of Britain. President Kennedy was slow getting industry to mobilize, so he had to send over every gun he could. Bye, beggar divert. The Major's eyes wi widened as he made the connection. It wasn't enough, not this time, gosh darn it. He was a crook, and then Speaker of the White House. Oh, Welch endorses Wallace, in an op-ed published today in the paper. American opinion far-right John Birch Society leader Robert W. Welch Jr. offered a rare endorsement of the MPP presidential campaign of George Wallace. 
and explaining why it broke with the society's traditional refusal to endorse political candidates. While throughout in recent years we've seen a central government taking more and more control over public education, over communications and transportation, over every detail of our daily lives. We know that this has occurred because of the efforts of a coordinated Japanese plot to replace our free republic with a national socialist collectivist autocracy. They've carried out this plot through the use of their useful idiots, the integrationists, the NPPL, the NPPC, the Republican Democratic Party, and Presidents Nixon and Eisenhower, all the Kennedy brothers and especially the famed family patriarch, and all those who have sought to weaken the U.S. through implementing liberal communistic policies that are so chaos and discord and leave us helpless before the Jap Nazi onslaught. There's only one political leader in this country who can, I can say with complete confidence, is not a part of this national socialist conspiracy. That man is George C. Wallace, daddy. This man flew bombing missions against the Japanese in the war and never gave up on that fight, not even after America was stabbed in the back by that Jap Nazi stooge, President Truman Atakagi. He has now taken the anti-fascist and communist struggle from the Pacific skies to the town halls of America, and is a lone voice speaking up for the state's rights, free speech, free enterprise, and all those rights which our founding fathers enshrined in the Constitution. He's not afraid to stand against the Nazi-created civil rights movement and its anti-constitutional demands, and has rested the National Progressive Party from the control of the Japan Nazi agents in the center block. Wallace is the last and best hope for the U.S. of A. He will cleanse this fair land of all German and Japanese political influences that and lock up all their agents in America. Only Wallace stands up for America, therefore I stand for Wallace. I urge all of our members and readers to do the same. Birds of a feather flock together and those two are cuckoos. Only Wallace can stop the New World Order. As the former Speaker of the House, McCormick occupied a unique position in politics, tasked with leading the House of Representatives, presiding over the administration of the House and the debates held within. The Speaker of the the position of speaker is at least theoretically as nonpartisan as someone in American politics can get. The delicate art of mediating between two rival parties requires a certain level of detachment for both and goings on both. As President McCormick could use the vest the prestige of his old position to his advantage by presenting himself as a nonpartisan element. Uninvolved in the unfortunate scandals of the past, McCormick can distance himself from the taint of Nixon presidency, selling himself as a clean, uncorrupted voice within the White House. He can move effectively, or more effectively, argue the RD's case and significantly increase our chances at surviving the oncoming elections. Well, it is what it is. A simmering pot. Days after days, the crowd waited outside the White House increased steadily until Lafayette Square was completely occupied by the silent protests. All around the U.S., however, the manifestations are turning violent as young college students who have been ensnared by extremist demagogues and radical politicians attack the police at their increasingly frequent gatherings. The FBI reports have returned, but the tone is completely different. Gone are protests and discontent from the first time worrying words like, uh... The likes of resistance, terrorism, and uprising make their appearance, with more and more agents dispatched to monitor the growing opposition movements for signs of extremism. Director Hoover is extremely worried about the future of the Union should the state of affairs not change. One thing is for certain, though. The president might refuse to open his windows to avoid looking outside, but the hate for war is growing. From colleges where the deans report acts of vandalism, disobedience, and secret meetings between students to cities, with the police stretched thin to keep order. America is starting to fall apart at the seams. If we don't manage to end this war one way or another, there will be painful consequences, in the literal sense of the word. Someone needs to do something about this. Aw, yeah. A question for President McCormick. Good evening, my fellow Americans. As part of my goal to bring transparency, openness, and honesty back to the highest office of the land, I am addressing you tonight from the White House to respond to your concerns and questions. It should be the duty of every president from here on, elected by a popular mandate or thrust into office thanks to fate, to make it into a custom to having a direct and honest conversation with the citizens of the U.S. to its fullest extent, and that, and that is possible without endangering national security. To this end, I will respond to several letters that have been addressed to the White House in the past few weeks, each one being an example of the hundreds of letters, messages, and telegrams that we're receiving here every day. The first letter I will address is from Terrence M. Dearborn of Dearborn, Michigan, who writes, as many have, regarding the former president, as a proud Republican, I voted for a straight R.D. ticket in 1960, yet it still seems unreal that Richard Nixon, who I thought was a smart and effective leader, undermined everything he did by his underhanded dealings and corruption, including ties with the many officials that now are on trial. How do you justify such a thing? How can I vote for the R.D. in 64? Well, Terrence, I speak for myself, and I hope the entire Republican Democratic Party will not say, while well, tragedy, there are other issues at home and against tyranny that we must write first. They were all convicted for good reason. They are not the RD party. Because that sounds pretty good to me. Just in case, just kind of spread yourselves out a little bit more. That's fine with me. Cool. Oh, look at that debt. It's going up some more. 18, oh, 18 billion. Oh, boy. Yeah, no, boys, we got, well, we got to focus a little bit more on civilian stuff than uh, what we currently got. Oh, look at that. CA upper uh, reports for duty. Nice, nice, nice. Ooh, Puerto Rico could use a little bit more love as well. Let's see. Anything else around here? Cal Cal California? Yeah, why not? All right, decisions. Reverse the draft? No, 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 no. We're not going to reverse the draft. You crazy. You think we're going to reverse the draft? 
At least not yet. South Africa's looking pretty good. That's why I'm south attacking. All right, East Coast. Why not? I love the East Coast. I really wonder how many senators are going to join the NPP after this. Yeah, Central East Coast. Why not? Yeah. Oh, look at that. Annual GDP growth rate. Not bad. And we will hopefully be cutting down uh, civilian spending soon enough. Air defense is very, very nice. Let's go ahead and grab some of this. Naval helicopter aviation stuff. Speaker of the House. Thank you. Curb radicalism. In desperate times, people will turn to anyone who can offer them a solution, no matter how radical and insane the solution is indeed. It is in this way that the modern Germany came into its nightmarish self. This exact scenario is now being played out across America as a nation full of scared and uncertain people trying to jump ship to the NPP. The NPP insists that they are they and only they can be trusted to fix America, promising hard-line solutions to fix America's problems as one might take a sledgehammer to a loose nail. If the RD party is to endure, we must make certain, the people of America, that the way of the MPP leads to ruin. President McCormick intends to go on the offensive, calling upon all red-blooded Americans to stand firm against radicalism. Their siren song, the likes of which has led to so, many, so much poverty and death in so many regimes in history, cannot be allowed to take hold in the U.S. as well. Such a call to action might help win back both wavering liberals and moderate conservatives who are considering switching sides. Well, you can say that as much as you want, but uh, you're currently involved in South Africa for the presidential debate. While a relatively new addition to the already tense and event-packed uh, election season, the TV debates between candidates for the Republic of the RDs and the National Progressive Party has become one of the most important elements of the campaign. The clash of wet personality, charisma, and policies between the two likely people who become the leader of the free world is a must-see TV. A public duty for the big three networks of ABC, CBS, and NBC, and well-respected cast of news reporters including Edward R. Morrow, Morrow, Walter Cronkite, John Chancellor, and Quincy Howell serving as moderators. In the light of the tumultuous past four years, or even the past year, both parties and the candidates want to show that they are more open and transparent and willing to face down their opponent in front of the live TV cameras. Wallace Bennett, top of the ticket for the RDs, and NPP's George Daddy Wallace is going to face to face in the WNBC studios at Rockefeller Center in New York City. The debate, planned to be on a variety of topics, became focused on economics, namely the role of free trade. Bennett spoke forcefully about how open markets, eliminating tariffs, and reducing barriers can help all the nations of the world. <clears throat> And his proposed international monetary fund can make the war and conflict between any nations a thing of the past due to interconnected ties. Wallace, while supporting the free idea of free trade, said that free trade should be free, saying that America should only trade with those whose nations have democratic governments and not with fascists and imperialists. Trade agreements with India and Central America to prevent them from falling into Japan's sphere of influence would be the goal of his administration. The partisans of either party would click to claim the candidate won the debate, but it's really up to the independents and the swing voters to decide who's actually emerged victorious in the polls to come and eventually the election itself. Ah, strong stance convinces voters. I love strong stances. The passing of the torch. President McCormick has done all he can with the little time he has. A few minute, last minute campaign speeches and fevered assaults on the opposition might sway the odd voter here or there, but by this point, most people's minds have already been made up as election night draws now. All we can do is sit back and hope that it was enough. Whatever happens, the White House must be ready to, to house its fourth president in two years. Preparations must be made for the transfer of power to the next commander in chief, and for the first time in over 300 years, that man may bear an R or D. That he might not bear an R D next to his name. Whoever wins the election, we must make sure that the handover is as clean and orderly as possible to ensure that the principles and traditions of democracy our nation is founded upon are upheld. The wait is nearly over. The polls are nearly finalized. It's almost time for the historic election season to come to an end. President McCormick and his closest advisors sit in the Oval Office. Fingers crossed. Soon comes a moment of truth. Glass one, Senate elections. Shh, everyone, I can't hear the TV. Oh, boy. I can't wait to see who wins. Election day. Cool. Across America today, tens of millions of people lined up in churches, libraries, schools, and community centers to exercise their right to vote. In Dixville, Notch, and Hart's location, New Hampshire, excited old-timers gathered in the town's ballot rooms at midnight so they could see or be the first in their nation to vote. Throughout the day, pundits on all three major networks have speculated who will clinch the necessary electoral college majority to win the White House. Will it be the brash populist coalition of the MPP or is the state in battle but still strong incumbents in the Republican Democratic Party? America has faced countless challenges at these past several years from political strife to bl bloody war. As the night goes on, Walter Cronkite of CBS is the first to announce the projection. The winner of the 64th presidential election is George C. Wallace and he won with 375 electoral votes. Moratorium to end the war in South Africa. Over half a million people have marched on D.C. to protest the violence and brutality of the South African War, denouncing the deaths of young American men and calling for peace on the troubled continent. Others marched throughout the U.S. have also taken place with similar demands to the end of war and bring our soldiers home. The most striking image was the sight of thousands of men and women in a single file carrying a placards with names of a dead or wounded American soldier, or a town and village in South Africa that has been destroyed, marching in single file down Pennsylvania Avenue past the White House before reaching the Capitol building. The moratorium. 
is a different kind of protest. It's not left-wing hippies denouncing the draft and leading to violence and riots. Instead, a South African moratorium committee sought support from respectable institutions like the civil rights movement, churches, university faculties, unions and, bus and business leaders, and politicians. Some of those that spoke at the big, white, uh, big Washington march included Coretta Scott King, Dr. Gingerman Spock, David Dellinger, W. Avril Harriman, and Arthur Goldberg. One news reporter has called the marching, marches taking place a somber, almost melancholy manifestation of middle-class concern. <clears throat> it's difficult to say the presence of so many thousands of everyday Americans will change the country's policies regarding South Africa, with some supporters of the presidents are claiming that the protests are actually a Nazi ploy, simply to undermine the efforts to fight fascism, a new America first committee to undermine the nation's democratic resolve. Some White House staffers are sure that a silent majority actually does support the president and the current path forward, but if the war continues on much longer, more than the American lives are lost, it would be that much harder to stay the course. All that we're saying is give peace a chance. Cool. How's the debt doing? 17 billion? Oh my goodness. I wonder if we could just like win here and do it like this. Nice. Well, the war's been won. Well, the war obviously has not been won, but American despair. Nice. Somewhat high. Cool. Bastion of liberty. Token civil rights. Domestic discontent. Not looking very good. But we're going to enjoy this as much as we possibly can. Let's go ahead and grab some of this, too. Wow. You just let them rip and they just go to town on enemies. Um, that's enough ripping for now, so we're going to hold. Just hold for now. Just kind of ha hang out, hold the line. And let's get Wallace in here. Minorities have equal rights, you say. Hmm. South Africa's looking pretty good. Central Africa's not looking good, though. I want to get him in office, though, but according to numbers at dusk. Oh, there we go. <clears throat> if you'd like to read about the Battle of Johannesburg, please go right ahead. So, McCormick had never seen so many numbers in his life. Right now, as the rest of the country headed out to the polls to cast their vote in what had become the most divisive election in living memory, all he could do was sit and examine the endless sheets of paper stacked on the desk. Newspapers, stat sheets, community keys from all across the country. The contents of the papers were buried. But on each, each, each of them, he had circled the particular stats he was looking at for the polls. The uh, New York Times and RD stood a good chance in Iowa, while the Boston Globe predicted a bloodbath in NPP's favor. Pollsters in Illinois seemed confident the Republican senator there would keep a seat, but news from Louisiana was not so encouraging. Endlessly, McCormick gorged himself on poll numbers, feeling his heart sink at every pore, showing and subsequently soared every promising result. Yet he found himself growingly, increasingly frustrated as the pollsters seemed capable of agreeing with one another. And this final result remained as unclear as ever. The uncertainty made him feel sick to the stomach. He knew they hadn't made the right choices, and the MPP were stronger now than they'd ever been before. Nixon and Kennedy were the reason he was in this mess, yet history remembered him as a man who made or broke the RDs. As the nights wore on, the official vote be counts began a few weeks ago. McCormick felt his eyelids begin to drop, or droop. Resting his head upon a copy of the Washington Post, he felt his thoughts and ebbs fear away. The fears ebb away. As sleep finally took him, he resigned himself to the knowledge that he would wake up to a brand new president, whoever that might be, sleep well, caretaker president. Cool. Alright, so let's take a look. And... So they lost five, the Democrats lost four, the Senate got three more, and MPP got right six more. Oh, that's not that much. I was hoping for, like, a blowout. Uh, sure. We'll help these guys. I don't even want to read it. So if you like to read this, please go right ahead. Oh, nope. It's already, it's already gone, so... Recruit. Cool. Thank you. Alright, what can we do here? Expand the war in South Africa? Well, oh, well, the domestic situation is somewhat middling. Um, at this point, I want to get Wallace in, and I want to win the war. So as soon as he gets into office, we're going to win the war as fast as possible, so. What can we do here? Um, I'm not going to do this anymore, so. Um, actually, we could probably lower it if we wanted to. Even though I think we need to keep some political power as well, so... Operation Ranch Hand. Let's see. Discontent will go down, maybe. Oh, we'll wait. Um, we might actually be able to, like... Well, once it hits January, then we'll probably do some more of it, so... Election results are in. Cool. If you like to read about that, go right ahead. Polls are updated. No one cares. Cool. How is the unity? Presidential election season is over. Um... If you want to read about this, please go right ahead. I mean, this is prob probably happens every single time, so we're just going to let it kind of go ahead. I want to take a look at the election stuff, though. Africa Shield offers a ceasefire. Oh, no, pause the game. Uh, the German Reich has contacted the Organization of Free Nations on behalf of the Africa Shield, the Germans who began this war, who invaded, plundered, murdered, and looted their way across much of Africa. The Reich proper offers a ceasefire to be set at the pre-war borders with no gains or losses for each side. On the other hand, some of our officers believe that we can yet 
achieve an outright victory in this war. That if we continue fighting, we might push all the way to the Congo Sea and end the German presence in Africa once and for all. This will be a monumental success for the OFN if achievable, but some advisors also remind us that the South African war has been harsh on the populace at home, watching the terror and bloodshed day after day. A stalemate cannot be viewed as a loss, and so it would be an acceptable end to this tired affair for many civilians. Yet, yeah. and accepting this, we might as well do millions of Africans to continue enslavement and repression. Whatever choice we make, we should do so quickly. We going, keep going. We will fight on. Cool. And let's take a look at this. So, uh, we have 34 Republicans, 21 Democrats, 34! Exact same number of far-right MPP as Republicans. Oh, man, the solid South is looking pretty good, except for Tennessee and Arkansas, and even parts of Missouri, but whatever. Vir Virginia, part of the Northeast, Minnesota, and the West Coast, and not too bad, and Hawaii, or Alaska. Well, Hawaii's not here right now, so whatever. Operation, stateroom, port report, 28A2D4Y7. George Jellicoe, the National Democratic League, has been appointed Prime Minister following recent elections, firmly aligning England with their international security interests. Founded by Claude Auchinleck following Himmler's victory, the main purpose of the party is to restore Elizabeth II to the throne and, by expansion, or extension, restore pre-war British society. The core of this party is Jellicoe and his Democrats, a moderate faction with ties to the old aristocracy that supports the complete integration of England into the OFN structure. infrastructure. He is a linchpin holding the party's two other factions in the team. The second wing of the party is Norman St. John Stevens' new Whigs. He supports deeper social reforms, particularly regarding women and homosexuals, as well as a more business-oriented economy. He believes in downsizing the British Army, and while nominally pro-OFN, OFN, he wants Britain to play only one minor role within it. He's opposed to Enoch Powell's Patriot Wing. Powell wants to maintain English independence and foreign affairs, albeit recognizing the necessity of OFN membership. His party also supports such a strongly reactionary line on social issues that the agency was surprised when he joined Himmler at all. Animosity between these two factions is greater than, e than either and the Democrats. Jellicoe is thus able to use his moderate position to strengthen party unity. Thus, it is obviously a great success for American interests in Europe. As long as Jellicoe stays in charge of the party and the nation, OFN dominance of English military and security infrastructure is guaranteed. Agency advisors continue to support for the NDL overtly and covertly as long as his conservatives hold the balance of power, his victory is our victory. Great. Uh, see about Zabiria. Let's see. Um, so we can help the, those guys over there. Yeah, we'll do this one. Why not? When in doubt, spend more money. Uh, somewhat middling. Uh, we're going to wait on that. I'm going to keep the political power for now, actually. So, At this point, just do this. Get up to three. There you go. Get some planning done, because we're going to, as soon as it hits January, we're going to go crazy with uh, just plowing ahead. Very worrying, huh? Can we get coup? That'd be kind of cool. Mm, keep spending. Keep, keep doing that for now. We're running out of civilian factories to build. That's okay. Operation Success. Operation Rushworth. Bobcat to Eagle's Nest, funds allocated by the Treasury have been successfully deployed in campaign to bolster most democratic elements of the British NDL party. Campaigns have taken the form of clean water, clean streets, clean government, vote NDL slogan. Equating NDL and public consciousness are very best aspects of post-war reconstruction. Currently witnessing waves uh a public support for the NDL, massive demonstrations against extremist elements of the party, even seeing calls for resignations upon, among party members. So far, none know the origin of the campaign or its funds. New Whigs and Patriots falling over each other to take credit. Quite humorous. We'll keep you praised as the situation evolves. Eagles Nest of Bobcat, humorous indeed. There you go. Spread a little bit more. Come on. Oh, screw it. Just go ahead. Go, go, go. We took one hook. Look at those guys go. If you'd like to read about this, please go right ahead. But and yet the war goes on. Happy 1965. I know this that this uh has been a little uh, short in terms of the length that we've covered here. So it is what it is. Um, would you guys? Let's go through there. There you go. Cool. On New Year's Eve, the Beach Boys perform Odd Lang Sign in New York City's Times Square, broadcast as part of the Guy Lombardo's annual TV special to millions of homes nationwide. However, it may have been the last time this lineup of Beach Boys performs for the foreseeable future. Brian Wilson, the band's bassist, songwriter, and vocalist, announced this morning that at a press conference that he will cease touring with the band and will instead focus on songwriting and spending time with his wife, Marilyn Roville Wilson. Wilson's spot in the touring lineup will be replaced by Glenn Campbell, a seasoned a session musician who had previously worked with the Beach Boys, as well as singers like Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, Phil Spector, and Elvis Presley. Bombard by questions from the press about whether he had whether this had to do with the stress of touring, burn up from releasing three studio albums in a year, or recent firing of his father, uh, Murray Wilson, his manager. A visibly uneasy Brian called an end to the conference and quickly departed. Re Reporters later reached out to Murray, Brian's father, who described Brian's decision as what always happens when you get too big for your own good, and what that his son needs to get his act together and stop letting this all go to his head. Other members of the band or their representatives at Capitol Records could not be reached out for comment. Oh, Brian's coming back soon. 
Yeah, hopes, hopefully so. Oh, they, they died. Cool. Oh, yeah, let's do Huguenot. I always thought it was Huguenot, but it's Huguenot. I think it's French. We're going to win before the guy even gets into the office. This is hurting our tanks, but whatever. Oh, there goes those guys. All right, I'm going to actually have y'all come up here. Anything interesting? Buy back our arms. Subsidized businesses in India. Man. Oh, there goes Goring. Borman has won. The bald man has won. The fall of Leopoldville. If you like to read about this, please go right ahead. It is what it is. The war rages on. And Borman wins, and so does George Wallace. My fellow Americans, we face a crisis. Certain elements in Washington have confused this great nation with Germany. Or well, the fallen USSR, well, they can order us around no more. America, I can guarantee you that for the next four years. You will be free. The states will be free to make their own decisions, free from fear or tyranny. This is our founding fathers intended. I promise you safety and freedom, America. I promise you segregation now, segregation tomorrow, and segregation forever. Strong words today in D.C. as President Wallace is inaugurated on this cold winter day. President Wallace's supporters claim him to be a champion for states' rights, while his detractors compare him to a modern Jefferson Davis. The new president is characterized by strong populist rhetoric, emphasizing the struggle of the American people against the political elite. This is a major shakeup for U.S. politics and shows that the American people are ready for change that the current R.D. platform simply cannot provide. And now, a special report on the Russian anarchy presented by a man who just spent years traveling the wastelands. Let's shake things up around here and finish with a new reading of a focus. The Wallace Presidency. Oh, I've seen this before. Saving Africa? Uh, I, I, this stuff would be kind of a waste of time, to be honest with you. Even though it's pretty good if you want to have the OFN more united. Uh, actually, it's not too bad, but we're going to win so fast, it's not even going to matter. LeMay's way, huh? Oh, wow, look at all this. More Africanization? Not bad. Whip their commanders? Oh, wait. We're bringing out the whips? Nazis will regret this war. New bombers. New parts. Africa will burn. More men on the ground. Nice. The Wallace Presidency. The American people have chosen George Wallace as their new president, one after the most continuous elections in history. U.S. history, at least. We, uh, he has a number of plans for America with regards to creating a haven for foreign and domestic business, as well as reforming education and welfare policy. Of course, the big issue the one Wallace was truly elected on is the Civil Rights Act. Wallace's victory proves that the American people are not happy with having such tyrannical policy forced upon them by the central government. His promise that under his government, states will have full liberty to decide their own futures unmolested by the demands of either Washington or violent mobs. His presidency is sure to be beset by a renewed outbursts of unrest from those who support the act, but he has vowed to press on with his plans regardless of what some idiots who have nothing better to do but protest all day and night do. We have 300 political power and we're going to play just a little bit more off screen just to help get to the next focus but I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check them out Discord, link in the description below and I'll see you tomorrow when we really begin the game as big old daddy George Wallace. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.